Good afternoon. This is Katie McLeese-Stevenson with the Nebraska Court Improvement Project, and we'll go ahead and get started knowing that others will continue to join us. We're happy to host today's legislative update regarding juvenile justice and child welfare and focus on the most recent legislative session that just concluded. We're very pleased to once again have Juliet Summers with Voices for Children in Nebraska and Sarah Halvey from Nebraska Appleseed who will provide their expertise and content for today's webinar. A couple of housekeeping items before we begin. Uh, first of all, for everyone's listening, please mute your phone, and to do so, you press star six, and then to take it off mute, you press star six once again. If you have questions, please use the chat box that is located in the lower right-hand corner of your screen, and we hope that there will be an opportunity for questions and answers at the end of the presentation. I also wanted to let you know uh, that some of you will be interested in CLEs, and we will be making application for this webinar to be approved, and Sarah Frankel will be handling that in the very near future. And then finally, a shameless promotion for the Children's Summit. Uh, hopefully you've heard that the fourth Children's Summit will be held September 7th, 8th, and 9th of this year in Kearney, Nebraska. And our theme for the 10th anniversary of the Through the Eyes of the Child teams is weaving together 10 years of teamwork. This will include national speakers and also local experts. We'll begin at noon on Wednesday the 7th and conclude at noon on Friday the 9th of September. There is no registration fee, and there will be a complimentary lunch on the first and second days of the conference. Registration will begin on the Court Improvement Project website on the 5th of July. So we hope to see you in September at the Children's Summit. With that, I am going to turn the microphone over to Juliet Summers, who will be starting off the webinar on juvenile justice. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm Juliet Summers. I'm broadcasting to you today from the Court Improvement Project office and really excited to be back and grateful to them for hosting the initial webinar that hopefully you attended uh, at the start of legislative session and excited to be part of giving this legislative update today on what passed and so what practitioners can expect going forward. Um, you may have already heard it, but Voices for Children in Nebraska is a statewide, nonprofit, nonpartisan child advocacy organization. Um, we've been working in Nebraska for almost 30 years. Um, we're founded um, in 1987 by Kathy Bigsby Moore, who was um, a foster parent who saw some systemic problems um, that weren't serving our, our foster population as well as we could, and so um, decided to do something about it. So with kids at the center of our work, our values are informed research drives our direction. When a policy is good, we support it. When it's harmful, we fight it. When it's missing, we create it. And community engagement is how we promote systems change. Um, and just FYI, I came to Voices for Children in 2014 out of the Douglas County Public Defender's Office where I was a juvenile public defender. So um, if you attended our uh, legislative update at, earlier in the year, you, this, you received this information then, but we thought we would run through it very quickly again, just so everyone kind of knows where we are in the legislative process. So um, this was a short legislative session this year. Each legislature uh, convenes over a two-year period, which is the biennium. Uh, the first year of that, which was last year for this legislature, is 90 days long and goes from January through June. And then the second year is the short session, 60 days from January to April. And so we just finished the second session of the 104th legislature, um, and which means we are in election season officially. And in each um, session, senators can bring as many bills as they want. All bills have to be entered into the register by the 10th day um, in order to be heard by the larger body, and so each bill of all the ones that are dropped uh, will receive a public hearing in a certain committee. So what this can mean is that due to time constraints, particularly during the short session, realistically only 
the only new bills that are going to be heard by the entire body are those that have priorities that a senator or the speaker or a committee has designated as this is a really must-hear bill. So that can mean that um, particularly in the short session, we see uh, a number of bill packages where one bill is received as a priority and then other senators want to hang bills onto it that otherwise wouldn't be heard at all or wouldn't be able to pass. And you'll see some of that particularly on the juvenile justice side today. Finally, um, one of the documents you received uh, for today or you should have received is or should have access to is a chart of legislation that was considered this session. And some of the bills on that chart you'll see were carryover bills. So these are bills that actually were dropped last year um, and they made it out of committee but weren't, there wasn't time, they weren't prioritized, they weren't heard on the floor during last year's long session. And so they had the opportunity to be heard this session. Sometimes that means bills can sort of sneak through early on and, um, and sometimes uh, they, the senators get to work so quickly on this year's priority bills that, that uh, last year's carryovers end up being indefinitely postponed. So on to the meat of things, I'm going to start with uh, juvenile justice legislation that passed this year and then I'll turn it over to Sarah who's going to talk about child welfare. Um, time permitting, we also have some information for you about interim study resolutions that were passed this year that the legislature will be considering over the summer and during the interim. And then, uh, as Katie noted, uh, we'll hopefully have plenty of time for questions today. So please go ahead at any point. If you think of a question, write it down in that little chat box. Um, so there were really two big pieces of juvenile justice legislation that passed this year. The first one was LB 954. You may recall in the fall there was um, pretty substantial news cycle about a fight or a storm brewing between the legislature and the courts, um, specifically regarding invest inspector general oversight of the juvenile justice system and of um, the administrative office of probation. Um, so LB 954 is a compromise bill that um, seeks to resolve that fight and it's the product of meetings between the courts and the legislature um, and specifically the State Court Administrator, Corey Steele, and the Inspector General, Julie Rogers. Um, and, and what it really comes down to is um, the compromise is the Inspector General will have oversight of juvenile justice cases when there has been a death, a serious injury, or a uh, complaint made to their office. Um, but the way the Inspector General will have that access is through boilerplate order language or boilerplate language that will appear in court orders and um, the promise on the court's behalf was to work with every judge in the state to make sure that boilerplate language is included in all judicial orders so that if you know God forbid there's a death or a serious injury or even a complaint against probation or against the court process um, the inspector general will already have that order in place permitting her to do her work of confidential investigation into the system, um, making recommendations to probation and to the courts about, um, about changes that should be made, and then um, providing an annual report to the legislature with no confidential information included in it. Uh, an emergency clause was attached to this bill saying that an emergency exists to get this compromise going, so that means that the bill was effective as soon as it was passed, so it's already effective and in place. The second piece of legislation I'm going to talk to you about um, is LB 894. And this was sort of a omnibus package in the end or a Christmas tree as some people like to call it. It was, um, it's, LB 894 itself started out as a bill regarding the right to counsel for all children charged in the juvenile court. And then a number of other bills were hung upon it after it was prioritized by the Judiciary Committee. Um, and, the, and all those other bills being added into it, those were additions through a Judiciary Committee amendment. So um, many of them, all of them, we discussed at the initial webinar that we did a couple months ago. There were some changes along the road, so I'm going to go through what the final package looks like. So the right to counsel piece of LB 894 um, does a few things. Uh, first, it requires that children in custody of law enforcement or other government officials must be not just permitted to contact counsel, which is what the statute previously said, 
but they must be informed of their right to counsel in developmentally appropriate language. Secondly, um, the bill requires appointment of counsel at the time of the petition being filed for children who are being charged with delinquency or status charges, but only this provision of the bill only applies in counties that contain 150,000 or more inhabitants. This was the result of a uh, discussion on the legislative floor um, where some senators from greater Nebraska were concerned about the cost to counties, concerned that it was a uh, problem in search of a solution uh, in, in larger Nebraska and, um, and, and an unfunded mandate. We heard all of those words on the floor. So this piece of it was a compromise. Um, and that when we talk about interim resolutions, I'll note that uh, Senator Panzing Brooks, who sponsored LB 894, is bringing a, a legislative resolution study to look at the question of appointment of counsel across the entire state and how that is working. Um, so LB 894, as it passed, another thing that it does is, and this applies statewide, is it restricts the waiver of counsel in certain situations. So when a child is under the age of 14, waiver is prohibited. At a motion to transfer to criminal court, waiver is prohibited. At a detention hearing, waiver is prohibited. And at any hearing where out-of-home placement is sought. In those situations, regardless of where you are in the state, the child is going to get access to a lawyer. Um, the final piece of that relating to right to counsel or that appeared in the original LB 894 that was passed um, is the Supreme Court is to issue standards for all attorneys who practice in the juvenile court by July of 2017. You may recall that last year similar legislation passed specifically regarding guardians ad litem. Uh, this piece of the bill takes the next step and says juvenile court is a specialized body of knowledge. It's a specialized area of the law and, and children are very vulnerable. We need to make sure that all the attorneys who are in the court are held to a certain standard. The next uh, few parts of LB 894, <laughs> um, I'll start with minimum age for juvenile charging. This was originally LB 893, also brought by Senator Panzing Brooks. Um, this piece of the bill is not effective until July 1st, 2017, so it does give a little bit of a lag time over a year for jurisdictions to prepare their process to make sure everybody is aware that um, this is the way forward and also um, to anticipate any particular local problems they might see. So I know I've already heard some discussions in Douglas County around ensuring um, what their process is going to be for very young kids and identifying the steps that they're going to take. So uh, what this piece of the bill does is it sets a minimum age of 11 to charge a child with a delinquency or a status offense. Um, instead, it moves court jurisdiction on, into 43247.3a um, for children age 10 and younger who have committed offenses or engaged in behavior that would otherwise give rise to delinquency or status charging. And then the process for temporary custody and disposition flows from there. Um, the best uh, comparison I can draw to it is it's like um, our safe harbor law regarding um, minors who've been trafficked. We're saying um, it may or may not be through the fault of the parent that's left to the discretion of the county attorney how to file it. but um, 4247.3a and Department of Health and Human Services as the agency providing rehabilitative services is the way we want to go with this population of young people. And again, that's effective July 1st of 2017. The next uh, part of LB894 was previously LB845, again, Senator Panzing Brooks. And this is uh, regarding solitary confinement, segregation, isolation, room confinement, <laughs> whatever word you like. The legislature chose the word room confinement and um, gives a unified statewide definition for what room confinement means what, as it pertains to minors or juveniles, uh, creates that uniform definition, and then requires any residential facility housing minors to track and report the use of room confinement when it goes longer than a couple hours. So the, this part of the bill, it, it doesn't um, set any actual prohibitions on the use of room confinement for kids, um, and, and it doesn't prohibit or even implicate situations where a young, there's a crisis, an immediate crisis, and young people have to be separated from one another to calm down and for population safety. 
Um, but it does require that when a, a child is going to be restricted uh, in their room, cell, or other area alone for longer than an hour, two hours, um, then there needs to be supervisor approval of that decision to keep that child alone and segregated. And it needs to be tracked and documented. And there's um, a list of, of required documentation that has to be submitted in reports to the inspector general, who will then prepare an annual report for the legislature, um, again, taking out confidential information, but tracking uh, data on the use of extended room confinement, disaggregated by race, gender, ethnicity, uh, length of time, facility, et cetera. And I should note here that the facilities that are covered include not only juvenile detention facilities, um, but also any residential child placement as defined by statute. So that could include your RTCs, um, your PRTFs, obviously the YRTCs. Um, and then also it includes uh, minors who are placed sentenced to the Department of Corrections for, um, for adult crimes, adult court process. Um, if you're under the age of 18, but in the adult correctional system, this bill still applies. Trying to turn my page. I've lost my mouse. Oh, there we go. OK. Uh, so LB-894 continued. <laughs> I think this is the last, last piece of it. Um, there was also what was originally LB 709 introduced by Senator Howard. Um, this it's a little bit it's a little bit technical, but I think people on the line will probably appreciate um, technicalities in the law and how they can technicalities can be substantive as well. Um, so it defines the term alternative to detention in the juvenile code, which was previously used in places in statute, but not defined in the term section in 43.245. Um, and it defines that alternative to detention as a program or directive that increases supervision of a youth in the community in an effort to ensure the youth attends court and refrains from committing a new law violation. It then gives some examples of what can constitute an alternative to detention, such as electronic monitor or tracker, or house arrest, um, shelter placement, etc. cetera. Um, and then it goes on sort of specifically to say, that um, placements that use physical construction or hardware to restrain a youth's freedom of movement and ingress and egress from placement are not considered alternatives to detention with one carve out. That carve out being manually controlled delayed egress of not more than 30 seconds. So that gets a little in the weeds, but um, I can tell you the legislative process behind that was a couple of our emergency shelters in the state um, that are regularly used as alternatives to detention have this manual egress button where the door um, is consistently unlocked and the door is to the, the outside world. Uh, however, in a moment of emergency, a staff member who's on duty and watching the young people uh, can push that button. That's the manually controlled egress delay. And what that does is it locks the door for just 30 seconds. This exception, um, some research was done, and it is consistent with the Federal Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention um, manual and guidelines for what constitutes secure versus non-secure placement. Um, and so in creating this definition, I think the legislature was very responsive and concerned about making sure um, that as long as this is in compliance with our, our federal requirements, that um, these otherwise non-secure shelters, you know, would be would still be considered. I think a perhaps harder question, or more perhaps more fact-based question on the ground, that we've certainly been getting questions about, is whether a, a staff secure detention facility would be considered an alternative to detention. And um, my reading of this um, this piece of the statute is that it really is it's going to be fact-based. So one thing the the bill did was it moved the definition that already existed in statute of staff secure juvenile facility, it moved that into the juvenile code. It had previously existed in Chapter 83. Um, so that part of the legislation isn't new. There's not a new definition for staff secure juvenile facility. But whether uh, an existing staff secure detention facility 
meets that definition or meets uh, the, the definition of an alternative to detention is really going to depend on what it looks like, whether, um, whether children are restrained by the use of physical construction and hardware beyond that 30-second manually controlled egress delay. Um, the other thing that this bill does is, more substantively, is it requires a timely hearing when a child is placed on an alternative to detention that infringes upon his or her liberty. So um, in some parts of the state, this had already been happening consistently, just like a detention hearing. If a young person was screened uh, into an alternative, like an electronic monitor by probation, um, in some places in the state, they were coming in, in within that 24, 48-hour window to have a hearing before the judge and have that, that considered. In other places in the state, um, it's taking longer, even up to um, 30, 60, 90 days before a, a child was getting in front of a judge. So this part of the statute requires, it places it right in the, the detention hearing part of the statute and says, um, you know, if that young person is wearing an electronic monitor, they're entitled to a, a 48-hour hearing before a judge. But it does permit that this hearing may be waived through counsel if the child desires. Um, and f finally, the last thing that came with this portion of the bill is, you may recall last year there was legislation specific to status cases that prior to placing a, a status offender out of the home as a dispositional placement, the court had to make findings that community-based efforts had been exhausted and a significant risk of harm persisted for the child to remain in the home. Um, this bill this year extends the requirement of those findings to all young people charged not just with status charges but also with delinquency charges. And um, apart from the, the piece of LB 894 that sets the minimum age, the rest of the bill is effective July 21st of this year. So that is the end of my juvenile justice piece. I, again, we're going to save questions for the end, so if you think of questions about um, these changes to juvenile justice legislation, type them in the chat box. And with that, I will turn it over to Sarah. Thanks, Juliet, and um, thanks to Court Improvement Project. I always enjoy the opportunity to partner with Juliet and Court Improvement. Um, so thanks for your participation today. Um, just a few things about Nebraska Appleseed. A little bit of background. We are a nonprofit, nonpartisan, public interest legal advocacy organization. Um, and as it turns out, we just celebrated our 20th anniversary with an event last night in Lincoln. So we've been around for 20 years. Um, and we work in the areas of child welfare, healthcare access, immigration, and poverty, um, public benefits advocacy. And we like to say that we use all of the tools in the advocacy toolkit. Um, so we do a lot of work at the legislature, as you'll hear about. Um, in this presentation, doing policy advocacy. But we also do work um, in the community, doing grassroots organizing. And we also have attorneys, um, and we do legal advocacy work as well, um, including impact litigation. And then we also have what we call the Legal Resource Center, where we provide technical assistance um, and other resources to attorneys to help them create, create positive precedents presidents in juvenile court cases, um, and also to kind of help us identify needs on the ground for systemic policy change. So um, if there are attorneys participating today that um, would like to join our listserv um, or have issues come up, um, we always invite you to reach out to us um, if we can be of assistance. So with that background, um, I'm going to cover some key child welfare bills that passed this session and became law. Um, there, I'm going to go over four child welfare bills, and then um, we'll pause and before jumping into the interim studies, um, where I'll cover, I think, four child welfare interim studies that may be of interest um, as well. So the first child welfare bill on the list is actually LB 894 again. Um, that is actually, I just probably should have called it a child welfare bill, but because uh, it's the juvenile justice package that Juliet was talking about. But I'm going to be covering um, the LB 673 part of LB 894, which is the GAL office piece. Um, the original bill was introduced by Senator Chris and then was amended into the 894 package. Um, so LB 673 slash 894 permits counties to create a guardian ad litem division. Um, and it states that if a county creates such a GAL division, GAL should appointments shall be made first from the GAL division um, 
with kind of two exceptions, unless a conflict of interest exists, or, this is added, the court determines that an appointment outside of the GAL division would be more appropriate to serve the child's best interest. Um, the bill also directs that counties that, that choose to create a GAL division um, should appoint, a, shall appoint a, a division director and then include some specifications for that position. It needs to be an attorney admitted to practice law in Nebraska with at least five years of Nebraska juvenile court experience as a GAL for children, including trial and appellate practice experience prior to being appointed. And then it provides that um, the division director may appoint assistant GALs and other employer employees as are necessary to, per, to fulfill the duties of the division, um, subject to the approval and consent of the county board. Um, and then the bill also specifies that the assistant GALs um, shall devote their work full time to the division and um, not engage in the private practice of law. They can't have a private practice on the side so long as the assistant GALs are receiving the same annual salary as each deputy county attorney of comparable ability and experience received in, in that county. Um, so I, uh, I believe that there are some discussions around this happening in Douglas County. Um, I'm not sure the latest on that or, or, other, um, or other counties across the state, but again, this is an option for states to create a GL division if they so choose and then those requirements flow in the circumstance that they decide to, to create such division. The next bill, LB 684, was introduced by Senator Kate Bowles. Um, and this one I talked about um, at our previous um, presentation as well. There was one slight change to it. This is a bill that permits the court to waive the adoption home city requirement um, upon a showing of good cause for biological grandparents and then a step-grandparent um, who is married to the, the biological grandparents at the time of the adoption if both are adopting a child. Um, the original version of the bill exempted the home city requirement, but then the bill was amended to allow the court to, to waive instead of exempt, to waive upon a showing of good cause. Um, and then under the previous statute, um, there was only an exception for a step parent. So again, this is as compared to previously existing statute, um, this adds biological grandparents and then a step grandparent. Um, a national criminal history record information check and a check of the central registry is still required for these individuals. And it also makes medical histories discretionary for biological grandparents and step grandparents. The next bill is LB 744. This was introduced by Senator Watermeyer. Um, and this bill deals with adoption consent agreements and private and agency adoptions. So not adoptions of state wards, which is already separately in our statute. So this is um, kind of open adoption. Um, and the, the, this bill was an, amended significantly from the introduced version. So I'm going to kind of walk through what was originally introduced and how it changed. So stay with me. I think that's the easiest way to kind of understand the evolution. Um, the original version permitted adopting and birth parents to enter into a written agreement to permit communication and contact um, after the placement of an adoptee between the adopting and birth parent. Again, this is in private and agency adoptions um, of children who are not state wards. Um, but the original bill said, stated that the failure of any party to comply with the agreement is not, was not grounds to set aside, revoke, or challenge a relinquishment or adoption. But then the bill stated that, the, that such agreements may not be enforced um, by a civil action. That was kind of one of the key differences. Um, and then required language on the face of the agreement to state that, um, that they aren't enforceable. Um, and so my understanding is that this was a reaction to a May 2015 case, uh, Monty S. versus Jason W., which upheld a district court determination that a relinquishment and consent to adoption that was conditioned on a contact agreement um, or open adoption was invalid. And the Nebraska Supreme Court in that case held that the legislature had previously expressly permitted open adoptions in foster care cases, but had not done so for private adoptions. So the original introduced version of the bill declined to do that, but then instead focusing on just making sure that the parties were clear when they entered into such agreements that they're not enforceable to kind of prevent the situation that had happened in the Monty F case because the parents, I believe, had not been so advised. Um, but after the hearing, and I think a lot of input, the bill was amended to clarify that the, um, the adoptive parents 
um, relinquishing a child for adoption, and, sorry, adoptive parents and parents relinquishing a child for adoption can enter into a written agreement for contact, um, again, in private agency adoption, and then um, made them enforceable. Uh, and then also added a number of specifications that I'll kind of walk through. Um, the bill also states that adoptive parents must provide relinquishing parents with independent legal counsel of their choice at the adoptive parent's expense prior to entering into the agreement unless that's specifically waived in writing. Um, the adoptive parents must also offer at the expense of the adoptive parent or the agency at least three hours of professional counseling prior to executing a relinquishment or written consent to adoption. Um, the bill is clear that the terms of the agreement may include provisions regarding future contact um, or communication, sharing information about the adoptee, or other ma matters related to communication or contact agreed by the parties. If the adoptee is 14 years of age or older, the agreement is not valid unless it's consented to in writing by the child. Um, the court may approve, the bill is specific that the court may approve the agreement by incorporating it by reference and indicating the court's approval in the decree of adoption, but then the bill is clear that the enforceability of the agreement is not contingent on the judge doing that. Um, and also failure to comply with the terms of the agreement are not grounds, again, to set aside an adoption decree to revoke or relinquishment or consent to adoption, to challenge the adoption on the basis of coercion or duress, or to challenge the adoption on the basis that the agreement retains some aspect of parental rights um, by the relinquishing parent. And then this is kind of a big um, distinction in the amended version. The bill is specific that the agreement may be enforced in a civil action and that the court may enforce, modify, or terminate an agreement if it finds all of the following things. A, that doing so is in the best interest of the adoptee. B, that the party seeking to enforce, modify, um, ter or terminate the agreement participated in or attempted to participate in mediation in good faith or participated in, in other dispute resolution proceedings in good faith to resolve the issues prior to filing the petition, and C, that there has been a material change in circumstances since the agreement that justifies the modification or termination of the agreement. And then the final version of the bill also requires language on the face of the agreement advising parties that, um, that again, the no adoption could be set aside due to failure to comply with the agreement, the disagreement between parties, um, or a subsequent civil action doesn't affect the validity of an adoption, and also, there's a required notice about the requirement for mediation before the agreement can be enforced, modified, or terminated. Uh, the bill is also clear that there shall be no monetary damages as a result of the filing of a civil action in these cases. Um, and this bill was Senator Watermeyer's priority bill. Okay, the next one is LB 746, and this was introduced by Senator Campbell, and it implements the, the normalcy aspect of the Federal Preventing Sex Trafficking and Strengthening Families Act, and implements uh, a number of stakeholder recommendations. So specifically, LB 746 implements um, the SFA's Reasonable and Prudent Parent Standard to allow caregivers, and under federal law that includes both foster parents and designated individuals at group homes to use their best judgment in determining in which age and developmentally appropriate activities, um, which includes extracurricular, enrichment, cultural, and social activities, youth in their care may participate. It implements the federal SFA's requirement to provide youth ages 14 and older with a document that describes their rights and that are explained to them in a developmentally appropriate way to sort of foster youth bill of rights. Um, it implements the federal SFA requirement that transition planning begin at age 14 instead of 16 under previous law, um, and that the plan is developed in consultation with the youth. Um, also implements the federal SFA requirement that HDS provide youth leaving foster care with vital documents. Um, and then it implements a federal SFA requirement to eliminate the use of AFLA, which is another plan's permanent living arrangement, or as we call it in Nebraska, independent living for youth under age 16, and then puts into place mechanisms to ensure permanent connections and support are still pursued for youth over age 16 um, with an applet um, who may still have um, applet as a permanency objective. And then finally, um, on the SFA piece of 746, 
It requires GALs to report on compliance with the Nebraska Strengthening Families Act as part of their GAL report. The bill also statutorily established the Normalcy Task Force under the Nebraska Children's Commission. And here I'll just put in a little public service announcement that applications for the task force are now available on the Children's Commission website, and they're actually due tomorrow. Um, so if any of you who are interested in that um, and have any questions, I'm happy to, to try to answer them. Um, uh, I'm currently serving as the co-chair of the task force with Katie McLee Stevenson, um, and so we'll be doing a lot of work in the coming months on the implementation of these pieces of the law, um, but also taking a look at some kind of second round recommendations and some initial issues that the um, task force's stakeholders had identified um, but needed more discussion um, and weren't included in LB 746. Um, and then the second piece of the bill, LB 746, also included LB 1034. Um, it was another separate bill also introduced by Senator Campbell that was amended into LB 746 um, that changed provisions related to the Nebraska Children's Commission. You can see the hook in there. Um, and this portion of 746 essentially reauthorized the Nebraska Children's Commission, which otherwise would have sunsetted on um, June 30th of this year, and now is set to sunset on June 30th, 2019. Um, it also makes some tweaks to the Children's Commission. It extends the focus to include strategic planning, not just on the child welfare side, but also for the juvenile justice, for juvenile justice programs and services. Um, it allows the commission to um, kind of extend authority to hire a strategic planning consultant to update the statewide strategic plan. Um, it, it like sort of expands and updates some aspects of the juvenile services committee um, to include a review of the role and effectiveness of outcome placements within the JJ system, uh, and uh, requires the development of a system of care plan. Um, from, the, from prevention through treatment for the child welfare system and looking at some evidence-based practice issues. Um, and then also requires the commission to analyze some case management workforce issues and make recommendations to the legislature um, around case management workforce. Um, so <laughs> take a deep breath. Let's take a look at the clock here. Um, I think we can, should we, Juliet, should we, do you want me to go ahead and should we pause here, or should we try to hit the interim studies and then take questions at the very end? I think, um, I mean, it seems like we have plenty of time. Maybe let's, the interim studies will be quick. Let's just go through that, and then that will give people time to write down their questions if they have any, since I don't think I see any just yet. All right, great. Um, so we'll just kind of power right on through then um, with the interim studies. Um, so as interim studies, just a little bit of context for that. Um, as you may know, interim studies are basically a chance for the legislature to research and educate themselves on issues. Um, many of these issues often lead into legislation in the upcoming session. Um, the, all the interim studies are assigned to a committee, um, but they may or may not have a hearing, unlike legislative bills, unlike L LBs that all have a public hearing. Um, the senators and the committees have to sort of prioritize uh, for a lack of time um, which interim studies will receive a hearing. Um, but even if they don't receive a hearing, it still is a chance um, for senators and the committee to collect information and sort of educate themselves on issues um, within the interim studies. So it's a, sort of a good chance to um, know what's on the legislature's mind, know what they're looking at, and a potential preview for issues that may come up down the road. So there are four interim studies related to child welfare that I wanted to mention. Um, and the first is LB, or sorry, LR 513, and that was introduced by Senator Howard. Um, and that's looking at some of those workforce issues. So um, maybe a nice tie-in with what I just mentioned um, the, uh, as part of the Children's Commission. Um, but to examine workforce issues within the child welfare and juvenile justice system, they'll be looking at, um, the interim will be looking at recruiting and retention efforts for frontline professionals within juvenile probation. Um, and the Division of Children and Family Services, looking at caseloads and workloads, um, whether statutes, if there needs to be any statutory change, um, and then sort of looking at uh, ways to improve the professionalism and stability within the child welfare and juvenile justice workforce. And then Senator Howard also introduced LR 529, um, and that is sort of phase two of the Strengthening Families Act work that I mentioned. 
Um, as I said, there are the task force is is actually just starting, statutorily established, um, but there's been stakeholder work ongoing. Um, so it's kind of looking at those second round of recommendations. Um, and so that, the LR tracks a little bit with some of the, the focus of the task force going forward and the subcommittees that have been established under that task force. So I'll just list those. Um, looking at the issue of normalcy for youth involved in the juvenile justice and mental health systems. Um, looking at exploring a more specific foster youth bill of rights with the input of young people. Um, looking at cultural considerations related to normalcy evaluating um, a potential existing and potential new grievance process for use in the foster care system, um, examining training issues around the Strengthening Families Act, um, assessing the need for and availability of financial and other resources that can be utilized to increase access to those extracurricular social normalcy activities for children in foster care. That's an issue that came up a lot. Um, like normalcy and access to activities is great, but how do we, what, how does the funding work for that? Um, and then also considering how to coordinate um, efforts between uh, efforts on the trafficking side and the normalcy. So as I said, LB 746 kind of covers the normalcy side of the Strengthening Families Act. There's a separate task force looking at trafficking. So a piece of that is like making sure that those two um, pieces are working together because the issues are very much interconnected. Um, and then Senator Crawford introduced LB 544, and that is um, looking at the alternative response pilot project. Um, and the court, more broadly, I think it's a coordination of informal resources available in communities um, and formal assistance um, through state systems to serve. So the kind of the informal and formal services available, kind of looking at the effectiveness of the pilot, systemic barriers that may exist, um, and the possibility of expanding that further. Um, and then finally, Senator Chris introduced LB 551, and that is to look at the use of congregate care for youth in the child welfare and juvenile justice systems, including some, some data on that, the types of placements that exist, any disproportionality, um, and the availability and need um, for treatment or therapeutic foster care or um, ways to increase our more family-wide community-based placements in Nebraska. Um, so with that, I guess I'll pass the baton over to Juliet to talk about a few of the juvenile justice and arms studies that have been introduced. All right, so the first one I'm going to mention um, is LR 514, which is Senator Bowles. Um, and this, this LR is examining the availability of transition services for young people who are aging out of the juvenile justice system in out-of-home placement. Uh, so many of you may have been aware of LB 866, which Senator Bowles brought this year. Uh, which would have created a transition to adult living success program within the Department of Health and Human Services, sort of like Bridge to Independence that we have on our child welfare side, but specifically for young people who were aging out at the age 19 from juvenile justice in and out of home placement, and they've been there for 90 of the preceding 180 days. That bill uh, did make it out of the Health and Human Services Committee, but it had a pretty large fiscal note on it, um, and it didn't get a priority from any senator. So it, um, it was indefinitely postponed this year, but Senator Bowles wants to take the next step um, and relook again at what you know, the best practice would be in formulating such a program, and then um, hopefully tee it up to, to try again next year. LR 561. Uh, Senator Christ uh, is looking at the YRTCs, so um, examining their effectiveness, whether the treatment is working for the young people who are going to YRTC, and particularly YR, I think YRTC Kearney, um, looking at the economic stability of the model, the uh, amount of money that our state is putting into them and what return we're getting, um, and in that regard, then the long-term viability of the YRTCs as opposed to some other model um, for our state investment in um, you know, kind of a deep end system for our young people in juvenile justice. And the last one I'll mention is LR 576, Senator Panzing Brooks. I already brought this up, um, which is uh, looking at children's access to legal counsel across the state of Nebraska. When she had initially brought LB 894 this year, it was in part due to some research she had uh, looked at. The legislature had commissioned a report in 2009 that um, sort of highlighted how disparate children's access to legal counsel was across the state. In certain regions, kids are getting lawyers almost automatically, and in other regions, it's very rare to get a lawyer. 
Um, and as I mentioned, uh, LBN 94 ended up being bifurcated between urban and rural counties. So this interim is an intent to uh, to look at, at at what those numbers look like today in 2016. But he called me a message last night. Did he want to say something? So I can't tell if someone's asking our question or is just not muted. <laughs> but but that's all we have for you today. Prepared, we would be happy. I don't know how we do it. I don't questions know. someone I might have. Hi, you can come in. Are there any any questions from anyone on the line? Am I still on? Well, then if, if there are no questions, you have our contact information right here on the screen. If you, oh. So I guess that's someone is asking if the slideshow can be made available via email. And yes, we're, we'll make sure that that gets sent out to the group. You should be able to. You should be able to download it. Is it, it one of the files that's available up on the top right of the screen? No. No. The PowerPoint is not. Okay. But Court Improvement Project will. I'm. I'm getting the word that they will put it up on their website. They'll make it available. Okay. If there are no other questions, thank you so much for participating, and we are working on planning another webinar on a area for the summer, and we'll get information out to you in regard to that. So have a great day, and thanks so much, and happy Cinco de Mayo.